Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. Well, I have a, a slightly strange and interesting talk for tonight. Um, it's a bit of an analogous uh, model for our practice and it's a bit general in a way, but I hope it will be interesting and possibly be of some value. So in my day job, um, I've been an acting teacher uh, for 30 plus years and um, teach a particular technique called the Meisner technique, but that's not really my main subject at the moment. The great granddaddy of all Western acting techniques, all modern Western acting techniques, um, was Stanislavski, Konstantin Stanislavski in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he had a lot of different tools for defining acting work, and they were all attempted to be based on some aspect of human reality rather than something that was just made up uh, in order to, uh, to act in a certain way or to promote a certain aspect of acting. Uh, he was trying to analyze uh, human life and apply it. So there's one little tool that he uh, talked about. It's not necessarily mentioned that frequently, but I find it uh, very valuable for acting as a kind of a framework. And it's interesting to take a look at it and apply it to life and perhaps to Zen practice, which I know is something that's not done very frequently. And in fact, it's probably never been done before. And after tonight, it may never be done again. We shall see. Um, but the uh, tool that he talked about is called the three circles of attention. And it's very interesting. Actors work and of course, on, this would be applied in a slightly different way on a film set, but uh, when an actor is on a stage, they, are, uh, they have an audience, obviously. And Stanislavski also promoted the idea of what was called the fourth wall. You know, you have a set with a wall behind you that is dressed appropriately for the space you're supposed to be in, and some set dressing on the right and the left as well. So it suggests a kind of a, of a, a real living space that the actor can uh, can reside in. But the fourth wall that faces the audience is supposed to be cut off so that you don't include the audience in what you're doing. They're observing and you're living in this uh, kind of fishbowl. So in the first uh, circle of attention, it's just you and your immediate personal space. It's, you could say it's your personal practice, the equivalent of your personal practice as an actor. You're doing your little activity and you're totally focused on it. And you're not paying attention to anything outside of your personal space. And that's a very interesting place for an actor to be. It's utilized when an actor is alone on stage, there's no one to interact with. So they're doing something while they're there. And um, you want that to be realistic and absorbing for the actor. But another uh, use of that first circle, um, is that if you are involved in a scene or you're involved in an action and you kind of lose your way and get confused or you lose your concentration, you can put your attention back on that first circle and re-enclose yourself in your basic reality of what you're doing and recenter yourself by getting rid of that outward stimuli and focusing on something that's very immediate. So the first circle can be used in that way. Um, the second circle of attention is a little broader and it includes other people who you're interacting with. And that's a lot of what you'll see in acting uh, and, and in life as well. A decent amount of our time is spent um, when we're not alone, which also takes a certain amount of our time. Uh, and that in that first circle, and we carry our first circle around with us if we're doing things that are just pertaining to ourselves. That second circle, which we spend a lot of time, is about relationships, relating, doing things in a slightly broader space. And on stage, it includes uh, either part or all of the stage. 
So if I'm doing a scene with two or three people, then I'm working in that larger space and it requires a little bit more focus to extend my uh, attention, my mindfulness, you could say, uh, out to those other poles that I have to deal with. And um, that's how we spend a lot of our time. We're in our personal relationships, we're doing our work, if we go to our job. Uh, that second circle um, can include the whole stage or part of it. And the third circle is used a lot less frequently. The third circle includes the whole space that you're in. So it extends you out beyond the stage um, into the audience sometimes and sometimes out beyond the audience. If I'm in a scene where I have to imagine the um, airplanes coming in for a landing from far away and I'm watching it, I'm gonna look over the audience out through the back of the theater and imagine that airplane coming in. Well, then I'm in a very large circle. It's an imaginary circle, but in, in a certain way, those spheres of attention are imaginary because we determine by what we're doing how large or small they are. So that larger circle also applies if I'm addressing the audience, which is not very common in theater. But if I'm Hamlet giving a soliloquy and I choose to do that to think out loud to the audience, then for that occasion, I'm opening up the larger circle, breaking the fourth wall, and I'm including the audience in my reality for that period of time. Then when I contract back to the second circle, the medium circle, I will you know, close that wall and go back to this other reality. So it's interesting, these uh, opening and closing frames of attention. So, In Zen practice, one could say that there are also three circles of attention, just as we could say, and we could say they correspond to three equivalent circles in life. The small circle is my personal life, my home life, my personal practice. It would include my time meditating by myself and taking care of my own uh, personal activities and my own personal concerns. So if in my home life, uh, waking up, brushing my teeth, you know, sitting on my cushion by myself, what I choose to do, my preferred activities, uh, if I go and play the piano or whatever I, I do in my free time. And that, uh, that's my, uh, my small circle of attention. And in a way, that small circle uh, grounds me for the other circles, because uh, what I do with myself and how I deal with myself and the activities I choose to do and what I choose to practice establishes my state of being for uh, going out into the world. Um, we could say that the medium circle of attention includes my family and my local community, my job, uh, people I come into contact with in my environment. Um, and the large circle goes beyond those everyday activities and everyday relationships into the larger world around me. And a lot of that is gonna be impersonal because I don't personally know the people in that larger world for the most part. Um, and even beyond that circle, there might be another one that doesn't usually show up in the theater. And with apologies to Stanislavski, there might be a fourth circle, which includes the entire universe. And that's even more personal in a sense. Um, so we might make a really big fourth circle for that. And you know, we may deal with the universe in, in some place, but I don't think it comes up very frequently. Maybe if we're doing the Galileo, Brecht wrote a play about Galileo. So maybe maybe he would he would be putting his attention to the actor on that fourth circle that's way out there. Um, so some of us uh, clearly embody the bodhisattva way and the expression of compassion in our medium circle, which includes our community, the people around us, particularly in our work. Um, and something that if you're interested in the bodhisattva path, it's hard not to think about that, that there are some people who are full-time helping people and maybe think that we're not doing quite as much as they are. Um, 
if you happen to be a full-time Zen teacher, that's one way of spending your life trying to help people through helping them to awaken and live a balanced, compassionate life. If you're a school teacher in the inner city, uh, working with underprivileged kids as my mom did for 20 years in South Jamaica, Queens, um, you're doing hard work, very compassionate work to help kids who would otherwise likely not really have a helping hand to get them through their childhood. And I know in her case, as a, a, a humanist and somebody who uh, cared about um, people of all kinds that she chose that job and chose that school because she wanted to do that kind of work and, and help people who no one else was really caring about. Um, and I know folks who are hospice nurses who spend their day helping the dying transition out of this life. I know a couple of psychologists who specifically work with people who have been abused and traumatized and help them to recover, which is also very hard work for them, uh, for the people involved and for the psychologists. Um, I know a couple of folks who work or have worked as prison chaplains or run prison programs. And those prisoners really also need someone who cares about them to come in and treat them like human beings. Um, so those people are kind of set on the bodhisattva path in a certain way because their work embodies it and they do that every day. Um, however, there are two aspects to that. One is that you could be doing very good work and I've known a couple of people who fit this description, um, someone who is doing very powerful work to help people on a very large scale, but who wasn't particularly kind or attentive to his family. So you might be very bodhisattva in one area of your life, in your large circle. And in his case, this person I'm thinking of was doing it on a very large scale. So he was in the large circle of attention, having an impact on the world. And yet in his small intimate circle of attention with his family members, he wasn't very kind. So that's also a possibility. And so we have to look at the bodhisattvic path in all three circles of attention. Uh, how do I treat myself so that I'm balanced and open and ready to relate to others in a positive way and supportive way? How do I relate to my family members? It's a pretty good test of you know, what you're really about. If you're very nice when you're walking around on the street, when people see you publicly, but you snap at your family members, give them a hard time or criticize them all the time. Um, so we want to look at that circle of attention, the ones that are most intimate within that small circle. And you could say that a small to medium circle, the people that we interact with and how we treat them. Um, and that's a good place to examine whether we're bodhisattvic, compassionate in our real moment to moment, day to day relationships. And that's really very important too. Um, and then, you know, how do we treat our coworkers if we're in a job with other people? You know, are we doing work in a way that has a positive impact on the world? It doesn't have to be working as a hospice nurse. I might be, you know, washing dishes, which I did at one time, uh, clearing trays in the restaurant or manufacturing something. But if I'm doing it in a way and with a sensibility to contribute something, then I'm still uh, following the bodhisattva path. Um, as an acting teacher, uh, you know, I've had acting teachers who were really mean, <laughs> not, not nice to the students and made them feel bad, you know, taught them well in a certain way but they would leave the class both on a daily basis and you know, over time feeling beaten up. So that's not a really compassionate way of doing that work. Uh, you know, I don't really uh, agree with that, even though you know, some of the masters of the past are said to have wielded their stick you know, pretty uh, freely. I think generally speaking, that showing people compassion and giving them a sense of worth when you're working with them over a long period of time is a better way to uh, follow the bodhisattvic path. So when I, I, I wound up teaching, you know, acting technique 
over these many years. And there was a certain point where I had to decide how I wanted to teach because I had this example of some of these mean teachers. And I remember at a certain point, a switch kind of went off and I said, you know what? That's not the lifestyle I want to have berating people and telling them that they're doing a bad job to try to negatively stimulate them to you know, progress. And I found a way of doing that very positively. And I really personally believe in that. And people have taken that system of acting and it's made you know, a difference not only in their acting, but sometimes it's helped them in their life in certain ways to have that structure. So I like that idea of working that way and being with people in that way in the medium circle. And then, and, and uh, I'll add, you know, how do we treat people when we go to the restaurant or when we go to the grocery store? You know, we learned how valuable those workers were who we usually don't think about at all. We think of them as kind of low level workers and it turned out that we can't actually survive without them. What a surprise. So, you know, going into the grocery store and treating the clerk like a human being, you know, I go in and I talk to the guy for a few minutes. I like him. And uh, in the restaurant, you know, smiling at the waiter and, or the waitress and saying, how are you doing? Makes a difference in people's lives. And it's an expression of the bodhisattvic path, in my view. So then finally, we have the big circle of the world. And that's a little bit tough. You know, in the theater, it's hard to work with that big giant circle. And it's also difficult in life and on the path to work with that big circle because we don't know all the people who are in Ukraine or in Syria. We don't really know that much about them. But we can extend our sense of caring and our sense of compassion out beyond what we know and feel caring and compassion and loving kindness for people in the whole world and especially those who are going through hardship. And when we dedicate merit, we have an opportunity to do that. When we, um, in some forms of meditation, we project metta, uh, loving kindness, towards people in the whole world and living beings. And my feeling is that makes a difference to us and what kind of people we are, but it also makes a difference uh, to them. So if there are people who are in trouble out in the world and we can contribute something, you know, if we can't join Doctors Without Borders or Human Rights Watch and run out to these other countries to literally help, then we can contribute something when we can. Sometimes there are actions we can take that are helpful, but as a very uh, baseline way of interacting with that very large circle of the world, we can take the time or the energy to care about those people and to extend that sense of caring for them. People who otherwise might not have someone uh, caring about them at any given time. So that's my sense of those three circles and how they might apply to the Bodhisattva path. And hopefully we can take a look at each of those aspects, our personal world, our community and the world at large and see how we're interacting both with our thoughts and our actions. Thank you.